writing songs. And it was right in my pocket. Failure of the future has to be a nation that is agile, that is innovative, that is creative. Welcome to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise, brought to you and run by Collective Campus, an innovation hub based in Australia that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methodologies, and tools to successfully explore new business models and disruptive innovation in an era of rapid change. For more information, go to www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Hi guys, welcome back to Future Square, the podcast all about innovation in the enterprise. Uh, today we've got a very special guest, our first international guest, uh, Neil Robertson, all the way from Boulder in Colorado. Neil is a serial entrepreneur and founder of many companies, including Ramen, Big Link, 10 Collaborate.com, uh, has been previously the CTO of Numerics, and most notably sold his first company, Service Metrics at the age of just 24 for over $280 million back in 1999 at the height of the dot-com boom. He is a world champion entrepreneur and investor. He is not to be confused with the world champion snooker player with who he shares his name. So welcome to the show, Neil. Thanks for having me. Great to have you here. Um, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Well, my primary goal is to get Google to suggest the snooker player instead of me when you type in my name and not the other way around. Yeah. So uh, he's still uh, he's still a little bit ahead of me. In he kind of looks a little bit like you as well. I know, I know. <laughs> he's good at what he does, so I'll take it. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit about myself. Um, I started in the software industry somewhat accidentally when I was very young. Um, when I was about 12 or 13, a um, good friend of mine, his father brought a Commodore 64 computer home for him to play I had with. one of those. Lots of fun. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I went to his house, as I did almost every day, to go hang out. And uh, he was writing these sort of choose-your-own-adventure games mm -hmm. on, in BASIC. You know, you're at a path, go left or right. And I got really fascinated by that, so I came over every day and said, let's go do some more of that. And he got a little bit uh, bored of it after a few days, and I decided that uh, I wanted to keep doing it, so I actually mm -hmm. found someone with an old Apple II computer. If you remember, Apple II had no yeah. lowercase letters, yeah. right? so back in the day. Um, and uh, just started consuming whatever I could about um, programming, which you know back then, um, it wasn't like you could go to the library and get a yeah. book or go to a bookstore. Yeah. Um, so it was really hard to find materials. You had to subscribe to these really obscure magazines like mm -hmm. uh, I think Nibble was the Apple magazine I subscribed to. And I just I just sort of got into it. Um, I'm not even sure exactly what it was that I loved about it. Just maybe mapped with the way that I my mind works or mm -hmm. it was my own version of creation. Yeah. Um, so I really sort of fell in love with the um, idea of just building software very early on. Mm -hmm. That went through a progression. I actually started my first software company when I was 14 out of my bedroom. Um, sort of unknowingly doing the company side, just sort of doing the software side and then realizing I had to sell it to someone yeah. or sell to a company. What was that all about? Um, so that was the precursor to the internet um, was bulletin board systems mm -hmm. for those that are of us that are familiar with it. aged. Yeah. Um, I and, say familiar with it as opposed to aged. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, to, to maybe people in their 30s, it's like dialing into AOL, but people ran their own versions of it. Yeah. So I wrote bulletin board system software for the Apple II and a TUI, and we sold that um, around the country. I actually had a business partner in New York. I was living, grew up in California, and I actually met him on a bulletin board system that he was running. So very early days of sort of like finding people online and yeah. doing things with them. And anyways, it was a fun experience that um, uh, led me down the path of going to MIT, and when I was at MIT, I really thought that I was gonna be a programmer. It's primarily what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. and Timing is everything. I was there during kind of the early days of the internet yeah. and got involved in one of the first real true internet software companies as a, as a programmer over the summers. I didn't mm -hmm. want to go back to California. Um, I wanted yeah. to stay in Boston during the summers. So I, I found a job. And that was actually a company that Brad Feld was invested in. Right. Um, and that was back before Brad was a actual venture capitalist. He was mm -hmm. just an individual investor having built and sold his own company. And I sort of learned the ropes early on about building internet software companies. 
and that sort of like started my journey down the path of moving more from being a developer to being someone who builds companies mm -hmm. and then eventually those things tend to take you into investing, mentoring, working with uh, venture capital which was um, the path that the people I was involved in went down. So mm -hmm. it's been a long, a long career, I think really focused around the concept of just, I think the epiphany I had when I was, when I was young was you could build something, but, but the idea of actually building a company to share that thing with a lot of other people mm -hmm. was kind of a transformational moment for me where I went to becoming a company builder, not just a product builder. Yeah, excellent. Sounds like there's uh, timing, curiosity, um, you know, connecting a lot of different dots, meeting the right people, yeah. just basically being out there um, over time that coalesces and the opportunities come your way and yeah, you know, it takes you to where you are today. I think um, serendipity has a huge yeah. uh, play in most people's lives, mm -hmm. no matter where you end Definitely. up. Um, and I think um, just being willing to answer an email about a job and yeah. get off my butt and go talk to them. And, um, you know, when I moved to Colorado um, to start my first company, it was probably the last place I ever thought about living. Mm. And so there's kind of a combination of serendipity and then just sort of taking plunges here or there. Mm. Um, and I've always been, for better or for worse, not very conservative about calculating the downsides of trying things. Mm -hmm which is partially probably why I ended up here in Melbourne, which is a pretty good life change. Um, so, um, yeah, I think those are probably common common themes in my life. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so you mentioned you've ended up here in Melbourne. What brings you to a uh, wonderful land down under? So I, um, probably about a year and a half ago, I decided to somewhere between take a break and, mm -hmm. and retire. I've been just grinding hard on so many companies for 25 years. Yeah. Um, it's a very draining experience, um, uh, awesome, but also very draining. I was just tired. Mm -hmm. So I took a break, I moved to San Diego, where I had a bunch of friends. San Diego has a lot of similar elements to Melbourne. It's a, it's a beach town, a very laid back lifestyle. Um, but decided I didn't want to live there, it was a little too small. Mm -hmm. And so um, Boulder has uh, a winter with snow and things like that, um, not a very bad one. Yeah. But I when I sort of did the calculus of what I wanted out of life, one of the first things I realized was I wanted to be in good weather all the time. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm sort of happiest. Yes, and uh, between living in Boston before and Boulder, I'd had you know, 20 years of summers, mm -hmm. I mean, of winters. So I decided to just go to the Southern Hemisphere for the winter as part of this kind of like recharge period. And my options were you know, South America, I'd spent some time in Chile and in mm -hmm. Argentina, and I opted for something that was just an easier transition. Yeah. So I do a lot of things in life by just sort of saying out loud to a lot of my friends that I'm going to do them, and I sort of, sort of socially contract myself into it. Yeah. So I just started saying, I'm going to go to Australia. And I'd been to Australia years before. I'd been to Sydney for the 2000, 2001 New Year's. Mm -hmm. Spent a couple weeks. And, uh, and it was a really, again, it was serendipity. Like four people in a row that I talked to when I started mm -hmm. announcing this to the world said, oh, you got to go to Melbourne. I've lived there, or it still fits your personality. And I went, okay. And I bought a one-way ticket, and I just came out here uh, with a guitar and a half-written novel and yeah. uh, a suitcase, and just uh, Airbnb'd my way around the city for two and a half months. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was really as simple as that. Yeah. Um, and has turned into something much more since I started the journey. Fantastic. Um, and you mentioned social contracts. It's a funny one. You, know, you often hear people say, "Well, how do you stick to a?" weight loss routine or, or an exercise routine, just tell everyone that this is what you're going to do, this is the goal that you've got and you're going to get there by this date. And, you know, I've got that social contract, otherwise, hey, you're going to be embarrassed if you don't reach it and you know, eat your words and people don't believe a thing you say, post that. Um, excellent. So we'll talk about that half written novel a bit later. Um, <laughs> first, I have to ask, what do you make of the coffee here in Melbourne? <laughs> the coffee here in Melbourne. Melbourne loves its coffee. Um, there are places in the U.S. that have a similar uh, addiction and passion about uh -huh. coffee. Uh, Boulder actually has a whole bunch of single source roasters. Wow. Uh, Boulder, a lot of people don't know this about Boulder, but Boulder um, historically um, is um, 
uh, food and food technology mm -hmm. center. So if you're familiar with like celestial seasonings tea, yeah, a lot of people would know that their factory is actually in Boulder, mm -hmm. and it started a whole bunch of the sort of organic, healthy food products. So uh, the big um, first soy milk producers came out of Boulder. Mm -hmm. You go and you get it, you know, any kind of like oat bar or you know kind bar, or whatever that stuff all comes out of Boulder. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, um, oh, I lost my train of there. Um, um, I guess. Oh, so the coffee. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it's funny though because um, the one big, there's two big distinctions between coffee, the coffee experience in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. The coffee's phenomenal in Melbourne, of course, but the coffee experience is very different in the US. Um, in the US, just generally speaking, people order big drinks. Mm -hmm. And it's because the coffee experience is not a, a meeting experience, it's a sort of like hangout experience. So, um, one of the things that was uh, funny and surprising to me is like, I just couldn't get a 16 or 20 ounce coffee anywhere here. Yeah. And of course, if you walk out on the street with a Starbucks cup, you sort of get, you know, laughed at. So, um, but that's a much more common thing in the US is to order what we call an Americano, which is just a sort of coffee, big coffee made out of espresso. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of funny. I still, uh, I go to the places now that I know have big cups. Yeah. I just can't get it out of my system. Um, the other thing is really interesting is there's this whole concept of like the third place, I'm probably stating it wrong, where each culture has a, a third place that they go to other than home and work. Yeah. So in Britain and a little bit here, like the, the pub in Britain would be the classic example of the mm -hmm. third place. Um, in the US, the coffee shop has become the third place. Okay. Um, and it's a place that you go and you spend your whole day and you work. Mm -hmm. Here the experience is have a little coffee, have a chat with someone, move on. There's no Wi-Fi, generally speaking, there's no plugs. Yeah. People will sort of stare at you if you hang out for a while. That's right. Um, I took my business partner to Boulder um, in January and she was shocked. She walked into a coffee shop downtown Boulder on a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. It was packed at every single table someone had a laptop out working. She actually took pictures of it because she was so, I told her about this phenomenon, she was so amazed by this. But essentially we don't, we have co-working spaces but most people work in coffee shops. Mm. Um, and the design of the coffee shop is about, all about free Wi-Fi and giving you power and that's essentially where people start their businesses. Yeah. Um, so it just, you know, the experience, uh, other than just the actual coffee, the experience is actually quite different and it's a really significant thing in the startup community. Mm -hmm. um, I see some coffee shops heading in that direction here. Not that it's the right or wrong thing, it's just a, a huge difference that you would see in the US. Sure. And yeah, and I can personally vouch for the fact that coffee shops here aren't quite as hospitable to uh, startup founders or just people working. Um, when I was working on my first startup back in Sydney, you know, you'd get a coffee, you'd pull out your laptop, do a bit of work. After about an hour, hour and a half, you notice a few uh, glances and you're like, oh crap, I better buy something. So you buy a sandwich. Yeah. And after another hour or so, you feel tempted to buy another coffee because, hey, you're leeching up their Wi-Fi and maybe someone else could be taking this type. By the end of the day, you've spent maybe $30 and you think about it, $30 a day, you're better off just getting an office somewhere in a co-working space or whatever and actually connect with people and, and do some networking and get some work done without having to buy all these food you don't necessarily want to eat. <laughs> I think one of the things um, connected to this, this topic is um, I mean, I spent a lot of time in a lot of different sort of communities. Mm -hmm. I've spent time here. I've done work in Santiago with the sort of Chile program. Yeah. Uh, I helped launch the Parallel 18 program in Puerto Rico this year. Mm -hmm. I spent time in Singapore. Um, and um, one of the things that makes good communities, we'll talk about Boulder in a second, mm -hmm. strong and accelerate is the concept of entrepreneurial density. Yeah. Is going back to this concept of serendipity is literally having people in close proximity so you just run into people or you run into someone and they introduce you to a great developer yeah. or hey I'm having lunch with a, a VC that I've you know that you've never met so I introduce you. Mm -hmm. This happens constantly in coffee shops. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the most valuable assets of having a bunch of people go there. If you just sit in a coffee shop called Ozone downtown Boulder, you will meet most of the figureheads of the Boulder community mm -hmm. in ATM. Yeah, it doesn't matter who they are, how big they are. Exactly. Yeah. It's a very it's a very sort of humble community anyways, mm -hmm. but I actually think that's a really useful um, a useful thing in terms of just catalyzing entrepreneurial communities is, is thinking a lot about density, is trying to get a lot of people in the same place just to bang into each other and mm -hmm. get that serendipity. Yeah, exactly. It comes back to that serendipity, which seems to be a, a common theme here. Um, was going to leave the bold discussion for a little bit later, but I think it makes perfect sense to talk about it now. 
Um, so Boulder, Colorado, you know, it's a mountain town with a population of little more than 100,000 people, which for our local listeners here in, in Melbourne, you know, it's basically the size of Ballarat, which I'm pretty sure nobody associates with tech startups or just business in general. Um, sorry to all you guys out there listening from Ballarat. Um, but you guys have what is, some might say, a surprisingly thriving tech scene. Um, what is it about Boulder that just makes it tick? Sure, so um, so one thing about Boulder is when people show off Boulder, they show off the mountains, right? Mm. Should, so it's, it's at the foot of the Rocky Mountains, and so for those that aren't familiar with US geography, it's a little bit west of the center of the US, and the Rocky Mountains run essentially north to south all the way across the US. It's a mm-hmm. huge sort of wall. Yeah. Um, so if you think of how Boulder got settled, it was because people were moving across the plain. So if you go east of it, it's just basically cornfields for a thousand miles. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can just imagine, I was laughing thinking of imagining them sort of like in their wagons, you know, traipsing along, and all of a sudden you see the Rocky Mountains, which just extends for 800 miles in either direction, and wow. people were just like, I'm good, I'm gonna stay here. Yeah. So it's actually, um, it's actually, um, it's, it's on the edge of the mountains, but it's not a mountain town. The reason I say that is that it's, it's actually not as isolated as people think it is. Mm-hmm. So it's about 25 miles as a crow flies to Denver. Um, and Denver is the biggest city in Colorado, um, uh, and it's, uh, it has a lot going on, it has a lot of historical industries that have gone on there around telecom and media and things like that. Um, but, you know, Boulder's always, you know, they call it the bubble, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's got its own sort of like politics, it's got its own sort of people that settle there. And it attracted over a long period of time just a really wide diversity of interesting people doing things like the food business or yeah. um, it's always uh, talked about as the, as the healthiest place in the United States. You get a lot of people like that come in and train because it's such high altitude. Mm-hmm. So over the summer you'll see the, I think the Japanese Olympic running team is always there. You can see them running around. There's incredible mountain bikers and climbers. It's, it's always sort of attracted mm-hmm. these people that want to be on the top of their game. So there's a good foundation of just high quality people there. Yeah. When I got there in 98, though, Boulder itself was really nothing from a startup community perspective. There were companies uh, around the edges in the, in the bedroom communities and mm-hmm. things like that. But the actual downtown Boulder was, you know, restaurants and bars and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, what I think happened there is that um, uh, it was really Bradfeld's wife, her name is Amy Bachelor, who decided yeah. she wanted to move to Boulder because it was a really special place. Uh-huh. She moved to Boulder, and as Brad tells the story, she said to Brad, you can either come with me, uh, or we can uh, talk about uh, not being together and see how that goes. Wow. And so Brad uh, dutifully um, and lovingly went to be in Boulder, and um, Brad is just this amazing, constant energy, and I think he just decided that his passion was still tech and investing, mm-hmm. he'd been a VC for a while then, and he decided to make his home a place that um, was um, was a great place to build companies. Mm. Um, that was a very long journey, and it involved a lot of people. And I think he did a very good job of essentially sort of putting out the clarion call to people that yeah. he had met along the way, and just convinced them to move to Boulder. Um, some was by proselytizing its virtues. Some, in my case, for example, was by funding a company where the CEO we found was in Boulder, mm-hmm. shockingly, and so I moved from Boston to Boulder to uh, take advantage of that opportunity. And a whole kind of combination of different ways to get people to come. And um, it's uh, and we just sort of built this really tight-knit community and really worked with each other uh, and sort of built Boulder into what it is now, which was a lot of ways to calculate um, the scale of a community, but I think it sort of recognizes the you know the third or fourth biggest tech community outside of the coasts, mm-hmm. probably rivals you know Austin, maybe Seattle yeah, now. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's so it's been so successful in Boulder, so small that um, it's actually spilling into Denver now. So the funny thing is, you've got this great city, Denver, this mm-hmm. amazing city, with lots of arts, culture, beautiful parks, lots to do, but all the tech went to Boulder. Um, but now Denver is just in an incredible um, upsurge mm-hmm. uh, as a place to build companies, partially just because Boulder is sort of, uh, it's expensive and um, it's full. Um, literally there's a building restriction, so there's only so much office space and housing and things yeah. like that. The, the analogy is very, very similar to what happened with Palo Alto mm-hmm. in the early days where um, Silicon Valley and it's sort of like 
very sort of like definitive term of like being south of south of San Francisco. Everything centered in Palo Alto, really related to Stanford. And that got to a point where people started moving into San Francisco mm -hmm. in terms of uh, building their companies. And when people think of where tech is now, or Australians think about where they're going to go, sure. they think of going to San Francisco. But that's really only been a phenomenon for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. um, most companies were built in you know, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Mountain View, all the places where the big Facebook is down there, mm -hmm. Google's down there, et cetera. So we're seeing the same transformation happen in Boulder now, where the Boulder-Denver corridor is just an incredible tech corridor that's very, um, very linear between mm. uh, between the two locations. Okay. So apart from sending out the Clarion call down here in Melbourne and getting you know, the best tech heads and, and venture capitalists from the states to move here, I mean, I'm sure you've got enough networks that you can uh, send out a Clarion call. But apart from doing that, uh, what can Melbourne? learn from, from the Boulder community, um, given that you've spent a bit of time here now, you've had enough time, I would think, to assess some of the common, uh, the commonalities, but also some of the key sure. differences. Yeah. So maybe let me um, give context to that answer by saying what I found here that I mm -hmm. loved and why I decided to spend half my time here now, so I live here half the time. and build some of the projects that I'm working on here in Melbourne. Mm -hmm. um, it, I say Melbourne, but it, really it's a generalization to Australia. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people sometimes um, you know, think, does this apply to Sydney? Are you pro-Melbourne, not pro-Sydney? I'm pro-Australia. I think sure. it's an Australian moment, not a Melbourne moment. I just happen to be in Melbourne, so I know it a bit better than other places. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was here, I actually just reached out to the tech community um, just by way of making friends more than anything was mm. like a year ago. And uh, the first uh, event that I went to, which was to go meet some people I had connected with online, was a hackathon. I think it was Battle Hack to put on a hackathon right, yeah. um, last February. Um, and the first person I met was who, who is now my business partner, um, Atlanta Daniel, who is just an extremely well connected person in the mm -hmm. tech community. So she really um, did a good job of shepherding me around and introducing me to a lot of different types of people. Mm -hmm. Then there were others that in the early days were really, really valuable. Sean here at QC was awesome, but introduced me to people. Um, Stuart Richardson, you know, was great too. People were, were very welcoming of mm -hmm. um, sort of my interest in the community. And what I found was that um, Melbourne had a, all of the ingredients that I saw come together in Boulder mm -hmm. that were needed to just rocket ship forward in terms of its kind of um, place on the global stage. Um, I met a lot of entrepreneurs that were very contemporary, doing a lot of research of current methodologies, mm -hmm. thinking about how to build businesses. Um, there's been a massive influx of capital in the last nine months, I think some $100 million dollars into kind of quote unquote venture. Um, there's uh, a lot more investment from US investors coming mm -hmm. overseas. so. For example, in Voice to Go, one of my friends I worked with, who's partner at Rivet, they put money in. Canva, Culture Amp, mm -hmm. uh, got in Wesley Chan, who was at Google Ventures before, and who I've worked with. He's now at Felicis. They put money into those businesses. Um, so there's more and more um, interest in breaking down the barriers of U.S. venture here. Um, there's uh, there's great infrastructure. Uh, there's tons and tons of meetups. Mm -hmm. there's, there's real community here, which I think is really, um, uh, really, really important. Yeah. So I got really excited by all of those things, and it reminded me of sort of like about halfway through the journey in Boulder in terms of like if I was going to put it on a timeline spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a really fun time, right? Like any individual could have a big effect on the community at yeah. that point in time. So the things that I think um, that you know, being here has made me reflect a ton on what made Boulder Boulder. Um, and I think some of the things that I highlight to myself that I think are valuable here are, um, so Boulder has this philosophy called give first. Mm -hmm. um, you'll hear, you know, Techstars talks about it a lot. Um, you'll see people hashtag it. Yeah. The, concept of, the concept of give first is, is really um, the concept of self-empowerment, which is um, every single person in the community knows something that's valuable to someone else. So if I'm a mobile app developer, there are lots of non-technical co-founders, yeah. founders, that 
can benefit from understanding just a little bit about mobile development so they can make wise choices mm -hmm. about how to hire someone or maybe to offshore or not offshore, how to build their apps, et cetera. And I think um, a lot of times in emerging communities, um, people tend to sort of look up in the perceived hierarchy to mm -hmm. those that quote unquote have power or success. Power might be money, or might be have built big companies and they sort of view uh, the exchanges having to go sort of like vertically in the stack. Sure. And I think Boulder did an incredibly good job of getting everybody to help each other. Yeah. And I really um, encourage everybody here to figure out what they know mm. that's valuable to the community and share as much as they can with everybody else mm -hmm. um, about it. Um, the other thing I think that's really, um, that, that Boulder was very good at was we really did share with each other broadly. So um, I was telling the story, and one of the companies I built, we adopted what's called continuous integration continuous integration, continuous deployment methodology, yeah. um, where we were rolling out to production about 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. and there's a massive amount of infrastructure you need to build um, to do that well. We learned how to do that because Etsy had put a whole bunch of videos online. Their yeah. team had put like three hours of videos online about how to do it. They sort of taught a master class. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went through this work to go do it and figured it all out and spent months and months and months getting it to work right. And it was phenomenal once we got it built. And the first thing that we did was get a keg and buy a bunch of pizzas, invite everybody in the community to come and we just taught them what we had learned. Um, I find that people are a little bit more um, um, closed off here about yeah. sharing. Yes. Um, and I can come up with all these philosophies about why in different communities different things happen. I think there has just been resource constraint here for a long time. Mm -hmm. Resource constraint of money, resource constraint of talent, resource constraint of like introductions. And so people are a little bit more um, uh, conservative sure. about sort of sharing the things that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, Boulder just, the, we just started with a philosophy that said like, we all got to help each other, right? Yeah. Because you know, we didn't have anything either. Yeah. And so, I, I, that's something I'd love to see happen more and more here where like the minute that someone learns something, they learn how to do great growth hacking, they learn how to do like awesome mobile app mm. dev or how to get into the app store or whatever, they just share that. Yeah. Um, uh, that's something I think is a, is a progression of, a, um, of an environment that more than anything feels like it has more opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, Boulder suffered exactly the same constraints, not exactly, but many of the same constraints that Melbourne does. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to invest money in Boulder. So all the VCs were coastal. They only wanted to invest money in, the co in New York, Boston, San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So in the early days, getting investors, even though we were in the United States, was just as hard as to get a U.S. investor to invest in Australia now. Yeah. So I've gone through that cycle of literally, like, taking trips out to the coast and talking to tens of VCs and hearing like, I don't want to get on a plane and I don't know Boulder and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, we just kind of did hand-to-hand -hand combat for long enough that we kind of got one investor in and then did two deals and got another investor in. And now, the, you know, um, Boulder is a place that investors want to put money into. Just like I believe in, you know, three, four, five years, Australia will be a place that global investors are actively looking to put money into. Yeah, definitely agree with that. And I think a couple of interesting points there. You mentioned uh, people are averse to sharing here. And yeah, I agree with uh, some of your thoughts there. And also, I think just in Australia in general, we're very, very much a risk averse country. Uh, very conservative in the way we approach business. And, you know, we run a lot of lean startup sort of classes here. And questions that I always get asked are, well, should I share my idea with someone when they just steal it? And my response is always without fail, well, if they want to spend the next three years of their lives building your idea and pumping in you know, 12, 14 hours a day, maybe not making a fraction of what they're currently making in their comfort, com comfortable corporate jobs, then by all means, let them steal it. Yeah. Um, and if you're not sharing your idea with other people, chances are you're not going to learn how to improve that idea okay, or get introduced, like you said, that serendipity. Um, get introduced to a third party who can help you with that idea. Say you're working on a real estate idea. Um, oh, actually, I know this guy from Colliers International. They're a big institutional property company. They're looking for diversification opportunities. You guys should chat, that sort of thing. So sharing is definitely um, critical, I think, if, especially for an early stage uh, startup. 
Yeah, I think um, I think so. Definitely, you know, Australia is a is a very mm. risk conscious and conservative yeah. environment. Um, you know, all for sort of good historical reasons, mm -hmm. and this is true of other areas around the world too, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you look at many European countries, oh, right? Yeah. I mean, Fran France is a very similar cultural, you know, bedding. You know, I'm, I'm actually a British citizen, right? So I grew up very early on in Britain and spent most of my life in the US. And Britain, generally speaking, is a very risk-averse culture too. It shares a lot of similarities with that Australian yeah. mentality. Um, yeah, but I think the calculus that you learn over time is the value of being open and, the, and what you'll get out of it vastly mm -hmm. outweighs the risk of someone taking an idea Correct. or whatever the case may be and, and really fundamentally understanding and believing that ideas are essentially worth nothing Time execution is everything yeah. um, when when you believe that you have an amazing idea it's very hard to convince yourself of that mm -hmm. you just kind of need to go through the cycle and experience how much effort it is to take any idea and make it successful to realize, you know, we say like, you know, the chance that someone's going to overhear you talking about your business in Starbucks and go home and do it is point zero. Oh, the zero. magic formula business model that's just going to work overnight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it just, it just, I'm sure it has happened historically, yeah. but it's just statistically going to happen so small versus the value you're going to get by someone saying, oh, oh cool, I know this person, or you should talk to this person. Yeah, oh, have you thought about this? Yeah, exactly. yeah, definitely, cool. Um, so we talked a bit about you know sharing and this concept of give first, um, which essentially is all about the ecosystem supporting itself. Uh, there's been a lot of talk coming out of federal government here in Australia over the past few months since Malcolm Turnbull became PM, uh, building the Innovation Nation and whatnot. What role, if any, uh, do you feel that government should be playing to support uh, the ecosystem? So, I mean, I've thought about this question a lot. Um, you know, I have spent most of my professional life in an environment where the government is really ina inactive. Mm -hmm. um, they, there are lots of initiatives that the government has. Uh, I think Startup America was an initiative. They're much more involved in big business regulation, mm -hmm. you know, cell phone spectrum and banking and things like that. But in terms of startup, um, the current climate is one where the government just isn't really present. Um, so it's been interesting coming and operating in an environment where just generally speaking, the government is more present in people's lives. Mm -hmm. It goes into their considerations of starting businesses or things they want to do or investments or things like that. Yeah. Um, and I've spent time in a few different places where the government has been very involved. Like I said, Chile and Singapore and Puerto Rico. So I've seen governments be very, very um, effective in helping move the ecosystem forward. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I love about what's happening in Australia from a federal level and also from a state level here in Victoria, some of the things I've <clears throat> seen also with CSIRO and Sydney and things mm -hmm. like that, is to see the government talk about innovation, knowledge work, entrepreneurship yeah. as a credible um, enterprise, yeah. as is one that the country is going to stake its future on. And something crazy people do. Yeah, is, yeah. Is, is really, I think, an important thing for entrepreneurs who have all these social constraints built into making decisions mm -hmm. um, uh, to, to support them. So, you know, one of the biggest reasons why entrepreneurs don't start businesses is that their families think, like, you're, you're what, you're going to go start a company, you're an yeah. entrepreneur, like, it's a real career. What are you going like, to for? Yeah, yeah. Go, go work for a bank, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, go work for a bank, get a house, take the, you know, like, yeah. this has worked for 100 years in Australia, why change it now? Mm -hmm. So, the government's advertising and talking about this to the whole community, not just the people that are going to take advantage of it, mm -hmm. is massively useful to just sort of set a tone that, like, this is what we should be doing, not that this isn't a bare data point. So I think that's that's a really wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think there's lots of approaches being taken. Um, if you take a look, for example, the Queenland, Queensland <coughs> Matching Fund, the $40 million Fund, the Launch Victoria Fund, there's different approaches to how to catalyze and facilitate um, what's uh, the entrepreneurial activity. I think all activity is good activity. Mm -hmm. All access to money, all access to programs is, is great yeah. when the resources are still fundamentally constrained. I think the government um, does play a valuable role in infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, there are just things that someone with the, the, the money and the, um, the, the, the metrics um, can do that like a venture firm can't do or yeah. an investor can't do. So 
infrastructural things are very valuable, whether it be working on better network connectivity, whether it be providing space for people to work, um, or programs that they can take advantage of. Um, I think the infrastructural side of things is a really interesting um, use of government. Um, and I also think government can be very valuable in data collection. Mm -hmm. So understanding the environment is a really valuable, is a really useful way to figuring out what to do with the environment. Sure. So, um, and I think uh, government, generally speaking, has the infrastructure and has the mentality to be able to do censuses and surveys. And, and um, also, I think um, to focus on uh, enabling um, skills development and upskilling. Mm -hmm. I think um, that's another area that the government um, has played in for years and years through different you know, collegiate grants and things like yeah. that. And continue to do that in more vocational ways mm -hmm. um, in an emerging economy where the skill sets are changing very quickly. Yeah, and I think we're starting to see uh, initiatives pop up that are supporting these short courses, um, which support emerging skill sets. You know, it doesn't have to be tied to some three or four year degree, which by the time you complete that, the world's moved on to something else. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting what you said, and I've never really thought about it the impact that this advertising campaign and all the noise that government's making in the media will have on you know the ear of your brother, your sister, your mom, your dad, your spouse saying, oh, are you sure you want to do that? Because uh, I remember leaving my role with Macquarie Bank um, over in Sydney to pursue a startup. And there was support, but it was confused support, I think, coming from family saying, are you sure you want to do this? What did you get a uni for? You're making good money. You're traveling around the world. Why do you want to work on this? startup business and yeah they didn't, didn't quite get it but granted granted I don't want to say anything negative they have been more than supportive enough I think uh, of this journey um, but that's very interesting and also you touched on data collection I find what the states are doing with opendata.gov I think it was or data.gov I believe is the URL yeah. where they're making public records sanitized public records of course available to the public um, to actually create applications based on you know, I'm not sure if the data has been synthesized, but based on data that, hey, if I'm a data scientist, I can work with business guy and a developer, and we can come up with something that may solve a visible problem that no one else is tackling. Yeah, mm. yeah I think um, government, in many cases, has scale that a startup company doesn't. They mm -hmm. either have a relationship with every citizen or everybody in a jurisdiction, or whatever the case may be, or they have all the transportation data, yeah, they have exactly. aggregated health data. Um, there's lots of um, just things that someone who has that kind of a footprint mm -hmm. can, can do in a way that a startup never could. So um, it's, it's unclear. I mean, there are other programs, you know, I spent, um, spent a little bit of time in Singapore talking to the government there, and, and they're, they are really good at creating institutions that mm -hmm. catalyze very specific things. So they say, hey, we want you know, venture funds to be operating in Singapore. Mm -hmm. Let's take some government money and let's start four or five or six venture funds. Right? They actually have a program to do that that comes out of the sovereign fund. So their approach is much more, is much more programmatic mm -hmm. than it is infrastructural. Um, and then you know, in, in Puerto Rico, for example, the government doesn't have a lot of money because the government's very in debt, but they were able to fund a program that essentially um, it's a copy of the Startup Chile program, um, and essentially what they're trying to do there is they're trying to accelerate the community by getting as many experienced people as possible to come to the community. Mm -hmm. So um, what they do basically is they have a program that essentially pays people $40,000 uh, to come and operate out of um, Puerto Rico for you know six months or more, mm -hmm. and that program is open to anybody worldwide, and over time, uh, the balance will shift from a global footprint to a more Puerto Rican footprint. Mm -hmm. um, but what it does is it gets a ton of people from all over the world to be in one place. Sure. And this is what happened in the, in the Chilean program and has worked extremely effectively for um, moving the entrepreneurial community forward in Chile. Mm -hmm. Chile is a tiny country, and yeah. I'm asking if it's four or five million people, I think. Um, and it's pretty, I always thought it was, was fascinating that the government would fund a program that actually gave money to foreigners, mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. to to come there and then they could leave. They would give them to your visa, they would take the program for six months and they would go. And then it was a very sort of ris risky optical thing for them to do, but it had the totally desired effect that I think the first class was 85% non-Chilean mm -hmm. and the fourth class was 85% Chilean. Wow. And it just, 
brought people that maybe didn't have these social constraints of like your family saying, what are you doing? You're yeah. in a company. And it brought great developers and it brought really passionate, you know, young people that were willing to just crank 20 hours a day. It just brought them into the community and let them operate for a while. And I think um, this goes back to sort of like Brad's <clears throat> strategy of what he did was he just got a bunch of people to come there. Yeah. Created entrepreneurial density, people yeah. had similar ethos, and just sort of just, the, my favorite uh, example of how this works is um, there's this video online, mm -hmm. um, and it's like at a, um, it's like at an amphitheater show um, where there's you know the big grass behind the seats, and there's this person filming, and they're filming this guy who's dancing. He's all by himself on the grass, uh -huh. and he's dancing, and he's sort of dancing funny, and they're kind of making fun of him a little bit, and then these two other girls sort of come over, and they're kind of like mocking him a little bit, but they're sort of dancing with him a little bit or whatever, and then he time lapse this video, and in something like 45 yeah. minutes, there's like yeah. 500 like people yeah. dancing. It's the most amazing um, kind of a example of how like one single person yeah. that just does something with passion and with reverence and just sort of doesn't care what anybody else around them is doing mm -hmm. can do to sort of infect uh, a bunch of um, skeptical people. Yeah. And I think to some extent Brad danced in the middle of Boulder and I think there's a lot of people that are dancing here. Yeah. And um, you know, sometimes the government says, here's some money, go dance. And sometimes people do it of their own volition. Mm -hmm. But I think that's what changes the trajectory of emergence. Yeah, I like that analogy about the, the dancing man and how it applies to startup ecosystems. And I know a lot of people in this space, myself included, often have friends come up to us saying, so tell me about this startup stuff. How do you get started? Because they see you doing it. Um, they may have some reservations about what they're currently doing themselves. And because they see others in their circle doing it, the social barriers uh, are lowered. It's like, hey, this is something that we can do as well. Yeah. And we just need a bit of guidance, um, which comes back to give first. Yeah. Um, so we touched on the give first stuff, we touched on government. Here at Collective Campus, we're working with some organizations who are keen to create spin offs um, because they realize that their values, their systems, their policies don't quite support the behaviors required to, to innovate, you know, take risks, move quickly. Um, you know, oftentimes they're pegged to some sort of legacy infrastructure which doesn't help them move anywhere near quickly enough, they've got short-term KPIs, all that sort of stuff. So they can on creating independent startups which they might take equity in, um, provide them with access to their networks, their resources, domain expertise. Um, and I think we're starting to see a bit of a proliferation of this sort of stuff. I mean, if you've got an opinion on how, you know, what role in general corporates could be playing to support the ecosystem, as well as you know, this notion of the corporate spin-off, if you will. Um, so, I think it's important for different corporates to decide sort of what part of the innovation landscape mm -hmm. best fits their current need. Yeah. And so, for example, you could see that there was a cultural conservatism in a corporation mm -hmm. that exposing them to more risk-taking activities such as building products and if they fail you just build another one yeah. um, or um, contemporary design and development methodologies which are usually much more significant in startups than you would get in a traditional um, corporation just because of legacy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, I think many times that, that can be enough to start the process of change and evolution in corporates. Mm -hmm. I think um, other organizations um, can design programs that bring external ideas that can be really valuable into their organization and that they can design um, pilot programs and roll-up programs that individual small companies would never have and that they um, can facilitate through their, their networks. Like I just spent um, some time with, um, uh, with Humphrey over at at NAB, yeah. and just spending time at NAB Labs and talking to what they're doing with the, um, the venture group there. And um, I'll admit that I went in sort of skeptical, not anything to do with NAB, but just sort of skeptical about the, when, you, when I peeled back the details of what it would look like, mm -hmm. and I was massively impressed at the philosophy and the choices they had made about how they run the program, mm -hmm. about how they run cycles, about who they get involved, about their commitment to um, getting the internal resources um, ready mm -hmm. to adopt and try something, yeah. 
in a way that they can run a significant test. Um, you know, I think a lot of times, um, like for example, there's a, there'll be um, groups inside of an organization who are tasked to go find disruptive technologies, mm -hmm. and they go find those disruptive technologies and they bring them in house, but the rest of the organization isn't prepared to yeah. adopt them, right? Yeah. So you see this all the time. Probably half of the M and A work is done yeah. under the theory, and then things fail. So um, my my higher level point is um, I think different large organizations have different kind of ordering of needs, and I think it's important to sort of figure out what those needs are first, mm -hmm. and then align innovation programs around that. And um, there's an increasing number of really good examples yeah. um, around uh, um, around Australia, where you know I think for example, um, Australia Post did a um, did a partnership with the Melbourne Accelerator Program. Mm -hmm. Rowan over there is awesome, um, one of my favorite people in, in Melbourne. And I think part of what they get to do is they just, Ospos executives get to spend time in the environment. Mm -hmm. Just sort of being around a different kind of thinking about building software and triaging problems and yeah. risk and failure and things like that. And I think that's a really interesting way to, um, you know, sort of seed those thoughts and bring them back into the community. So. Yeah. Different strokes for different folks, um, but I love that it's everybody's thinking about it right now. Yeah, it seems to be the case, and um, I like what you said about having the system there to support you know these new disruptive technologies uh, coming in from the outside. You know, uh, you, it's it's more than just a matter of a senior executive getting up in front of five hundred people at a town hall meeting and saying, "Hey, go out there, be bold, be innovative," but not doing anything to support the underlying system, structures, values, processes, the way resources are allocated. You know, I see instances of hackathons being run, but no resources being made available to do anything with prototypes that come out of that. Um, we see a lot of organizations um, building a prototype, getting some customer validation, and then IT will say, okay, thank you very much, we'll have that, we need to put it onto our legacy systems, and the cost goes up 10x and no one's got budget for it and there's so many sticking points or acquisitions as well we find uh, there's a tendency to acquire and integrate um, which one increases costs but then you're you know you're binding these founders to some sort of system these bureaucratic system that they're not really comfortable with they end up leaving so you spent a ton of money buying and in integrating a startup and then the value diminishes yeah. I think um if I understood it correctly, another great example was I think um, Telstra um, did a like a low power IoT mm. network here in, in Melbourne around a hackathon That's right. and a test they were doing. And so I love that concept of like someone who has the resources to be able to set up real actual real world infrastructure. Mm. And to some extent, it's an incredibly effective way for them to understand the value of doing a larger national deploy of an yeah. IoT network is to get a bunch of startups to try things out and see what people would do. Mm. Like nobody, whether it's a large corporate or a startup, knows exactly how things are gonna go. Yeah. And so what do you have, what assets do you have that you can put on the table to create small trials yeah. to give further insights? And I think um, I've, I've talked to a lot of the corporations here and they're starting to think about those things. So whether it's, you know, now there's a ton, tons of customers or, you know, you know, Ospos has amazing physical locations all over the country, where the case may be. I've heard these really interesting things about, like, okay, what's, our, what's our footprint? What do we have that we could put on the table to try some things out and learn? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's more of a, a partnership of, of uh, you know, startups and corporations forming around around these things that's got bi-directional value. Yeah, and I think it just starts with conceding that we haven't got all the answers and we need to go outside of the building and find people who can complement what we know. Right. Yeah, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to change tact. I'm going to head to the, the more sort of informal, uh, casual, fun part of the, the podcast. Not to say that it hasn't been fun up until now, but we're going to get even more fun. So you are a co-founder of 10 XR, um, which you co-founded with Jeff Ma, who famously was featured as one of the guys in the book and I believe a movie was also made about it called Bringing Down the House, the inside story of six MIT students who took Vegas for millions. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a bit about working with Jeff? Yeah, so it's, it's sort of funny um, how, again, serendipity, right? Yeah. Uh, so when I sold my first company, when you're 
24 and you sell a company, mm -hmm. what do you want to do with your money? I decided to open a bar, yeah. right? So As you do. Uh, as you do. So I got some friends together and we decided to open this bar in Boston and we went looking for some other investors. And Jeff, who unbeknownst to me at the time had made money mm -hmm. doing the uh, blackjack stuff in, in uh, Vegas, put some money in. So I got to know him. And it was just at the time when Ben Mesrick, the author of Bringing Down the House, yeah. was writing the book and I got to know Ben. We all became fast friends and started spending a lot of time with each other. And that, like you said, that book then ended up getting made into a movie called 21. Mm -hmm. And um, the producer was uh, sort of, Kevin Spacey sort of produced the movie and had just brought in a partner named Dana Brunetti, who was also a young guy. So Dana Brunetti became friends with all of us. Dana Brunetti is now this like, incredible big wig in Hollywood. If you look at the news, he and yeah. Kevin just took over Relativity Media, Relativity Studios. He produced Fifty Shades of Grey, Captain Phillips, wow. uh, Social Network, or, also another book by Ben. But this is like when all of us were just, you know, just running around like crazy little kids. Yeah. And, and the book came out and just did incredibly, uh, incredibly well. So um, Jeff, Jeff is sort of a, a phenomenon. He's one of the smartest people that I know, and. His specialty, unbeknownst to most people, is actually sports statistics. So he built another business beforehand called Citizen Sports, which he sold to Yahoo. Mm -hmm. And he actually um, sits on a lot of um, radio programs actually about sports analysis. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just the way that his mind works, his ability to sort of just like almost like Google hunting style, sort of see statistics and process them. Um, but uh, combined with that, he has this incredible um, uh, work ethic. And so, what people, I think, don't realize about um, the way that um, they sort of built these blackjack systems is that mm -hmm. it's one thing to sort of get a probability table of how you basically count cards and when you bet more or bet less, but the environment in Las Vegas is one where you have to essentially also be pretending like you're not doing it and you have to be talking to the guy next to you and the girl to the right to you, you gotta be making fun of the dealer, you gotta like, you know, things going on and be drinking drinks and like, you know, you can't just sit there and look you got a calculator. And so they spent hours a day, like something like four hours a day, wow. just like sitting with each other, counting cards and having conversations and like doing this and doing that. And then someone saying, what's the count? What's the count? What's the count? And they did this for, for months and months and months until they essentially just absorbed it like, you know, it's like in the Borm Supremacy where he, like, he goes into the diner and he's like, I know the, I know the uh, license plate number of every single car in the parking lot that I yeah. just walked through. They just knew it that well. So in any environment, any situation, they could essentially keep the count. Um, so someone like that, you can imagine applying that kind of like just statistical mind and mm. work ethic to a startup. Um, it's, uh, it's, hard to keep up with, uh, it's hard to keep up with Jeff. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a pretty amazing guy to work with. Sounds like a pretty potent formula. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So, I just want to close out with a couple questions on tech founders. Uh, what are three you know, key skills or characteristics that you look for um, in a founder, particularly if you are looking to invest? Sure. So, um, from an investment perspective, um, and so I think there's... Uh, it depends a little bit if the founder is actually technical, mm -hmm. if the founder I'm talking to is technical or not technical. So I'll say general ones, then I'll sort of say specifics about each. Um, general ones is um, I really love it when people are extremely well researched. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've actually noticed about um, the Australian community yeah. is, and what we were actually talking about this on a panel at Zendesk the other day about sort of heading into the US is. Um, is people are not as well educated about what's going on in the U.S. Um, or in other markets, not just the U.S. And many times they'll be building companies here where there's three or four companies just like that in the U.S. and they seem surprised to find out about these companies. Yeah. Um, I think part of it is a little bit of like, um, you know, you're kind of aware of what's going on in your own community. Yeah, okay, yeah. And I've actually also noticed that just because I consume all of the same online resources here as I do mm -hmm. in the U.S., um, everybody pushes you to Australian versions of their sites, yeah. and you literally have to proxy around it to go and actually see news about the rest of the world. So if you look at Business Insider, they'll push you to businessinsider.com.au. TechCrunch, you can see, still see all the U.S. news, but tons of these pubs actually um, sort of forced to Australian um, skews of things. And I think people um, just 
don't either think about that or they get used to it. Mm -hmm. And so the number one thing I would, I would love to see is just people actually setting up a browser with a proxy and surfing the, the US or UK or mm -hmm. Canadian versions of sites. Yeah. You become much more educated about what's going on. Um, the other two things, the other um, two sites that I'm really surprised that people don't use here very consistently, maybe 10% of an audience when I ask them says this, is people don't use AngelList here. Mm -hmm. AngelList is a de rigueur standard in the US. If you're building a company, you put your business on AngelList, you put your information up, it's very transparent. Mm -hmm. um, it's where the first thing you do when you hear about a company is you go to AngelList and you look it up. And then similarly is Crunchbase. Yeah. So people don't list on Crunchbase either. And so um, from a US perspective, it's, it's a legitimacy thing. So mm -hmm. if I hear about a business, then literally type in business name Crunchbase. Yeah. If there's no listing, I'm already on the back foot about wondering about that business. So, not that everybody has to essentially play the U.S. game, but thinking from a global perspective, mm -hmm. um, both doing research and becoming researchable yeah. um, are something that I look for in founders. And founders, some founders are very, very good at that. Um, I, I also really like it when founders have a conviction about what they want to do and a business model even if I don't dis if I don't agree with that approach, mm -hmm. I would rather have someone say, "Here's the first bowling pin we're going to knock down. Here's why I think it is. Then we're going to get a number two, number three, number yeah. four, rather than here's like three models that we could get into, mm -hmm. and we might do this, we might do that, we might do that." Because any business model that you pick, whether it's just you know just try to like growth hack freemium upgrades to a uh, you know, piece of like, you know, marketing automation software or something more complicated like you know, uh, on-demand delivery services. Um, it takes real work to refine any one business model. Yeah. And so uh, to me it's more about the, the, the thinking all the way through the process of why you get a conviction about doing that one thing. Um, again, I'd rather, I'd almost rather invest in someone where I didn't totally believe in that conviction mm -hmm. versus someone who said, well, here's three possible things that we can do and, and didn't come to a conclusion of the best one um, mm -hmm. to at least go after first. Um, and that, that I think is a little bit of this sort of like conservative and risk side of things. Like yeah. rather than be wrong, you hedge. Yeah, in the US or in other markets I've seen, like just sort of like be wrong and be wrong fast and then yeah. go to the next one. Calculate the right. risk, yeah. Um, so that's the second one. Um, I uh, I think um, from I think this is sort of a reciprocal comment. I think I, I like to see non-technical founders spending some time and energy trying to get at least cocktail conversationally competent. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of non-technical founders spend a huge amount of time and energy um, sort of outsourcing the responsibility mm -hmm. of, of understanding the tech to other people, yeah. you just kind of can't do that. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's a lot of mechanisms now, whether it's like, you know, Code Academy or yeah. going online and just learning a little bit of tech or just reading about stuff that can help you understand a little bit more of the questions asked and, and what to do. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think sort of conversely, pure developers, um, uh, fall into the trap sometimes of thinking that like, you know, like product or features solve every yeah. single problem. Yeah. And my favorite kinds of, of entrepreneurs are those that have sort of a little bit migrated to the middle no matter where they came from. Mm -hmm. They're non-technical founders that are competent enough to like recognize a good or bad developer or drive development costs through product or a developer that can sit there and talk about business models as much as they can talk about you know, if they want to use Node or some other technology to build things. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's kind of what I uh, what I look for. And I would say the fourth thing, which is also something that I um, am seeing increase here, is just an obsession with metrics. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, things are so measurable now, and there are such good examples of where your measurements should be, either comp examples in terms of other people you might get funded against, yeah. or uh, unit economics in terms of the, how the business scales. I see a lot of entrepreneurs, this is true both in the US and here, who um, don't really look at those metrics and they say, well, I've sold 100, I've sold 1,000, mm. but if you sort of scale the metrics up, you know, the bigger the business gets, the worse it gets. Yeah. Um, and I think there is a, absolutely the, um, the gestalt of the US now is metrics, 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 metrics right? From day one, like mm. instrument everything, understand the data, make choices based on at least, a, if you're gonna make choices against the data, at least know why you're making it against the data, not just because you feel it out. Yeah. 
um, that's just a good, it's a good habit and not something that I see as commonly yeah. here. Just because it's like a really loud, you know, refrain in the U.S. right now. Like mm. investors won't talk to you unless you have metrics. Yeah, actionable metrics above all. Fantastic. So well researched, um, conviction, educated, technical competence through a sufficient degree, and ultimately <coughs> metrics, metrics, metrics. Cool. Excellent. All right, we're just going to wrap up with our what I will today call our Tim Ferriss component of the show, where we ask you what keeps you going, how you get the most out of every day, whether it's physical routine, whether it's nutrition, uh, mindfulness training, how do you get the most out of every day, how do you maintain your dynamism, um, and just do so much. Um, <laughs> it depends on the day. Some things that I've... Uh, some things that I've learned, I, I went through this process about, geez, a number of years ago now where I basically took everything I did in the day mm -hmm. and I did the exact same things, but I just reordered it in the day. And what I realized that there were some things that I much preferred to do at different times of the day than I thought. Mm -hmm. So you say to people like, oh, hey, you know, what's the last book you read? And they go, oh, I, you know, I get into bed and I read for 10 minutes and I fall asleep. I was always that person and then, and it, it seemed intuitive to me that I would never want to read in the morning. Yeah. I then switched it so I literally get out of bed and I walk to a coffee shop mm -hmm. and I read. That's the first thing I do every day. Yeah. I don't ever check, my, I haven't checked my email until I'm done with that routine in the last six years, yeah. right? Never miss a single day. Mm -hmm. So that's really important to me to start my day with sort of nourishment, mm -hmm. if you will, rather than like waking up and looking at your phone and like all the fire at your phone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, um, part of the reason why I came to warmer climates is I like to just progressively be outside and be healthy and active and so I try to mix getting out of my house, getting out of the office every day mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, try to do a little bit of kite surfing, get in a run, go to the gym, uh, even just go a few blocks away from the beach, go down and just sit on the beach for 30 minutes, yep. soak up some vitamin uh, D, E, whatever it is I'm getting. Yeah. Um, and trying to do really focused blasts of work and then taking a break as opposed to sort of like chipping away in this sort of non-stop, do I have more email, do I have more email every yeah. single day? Yeah. Um, it's hard. It's, um, I think it's every day is recommitting to the discipline of the life you want to lead. Yeah. And um, I'm also trying to be more forgiving with myself when I don't succeed because it's essentially impossible mm -hmm. to succeed every day. So yeah. three out of five stars every day uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, but yeah. yeah, I also recently switched to checking email three times a day, literally reply to what I need to reply to and close it. And I found that to be so cleansing and I just get so much more done in between that yeah. rather than constantly eyeballing back and forth to email and whatever else I'm doing and suffering that cognitive switching penalty and whatnot. Yeah, I think um, I've got a lot of projects going on right now. We just uh, launched a new company. I started a company over the summer. We're working on a venture fund here. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'm starting to appreciate the context switching costs are very high mentally. Mm. So uh, doing something just like that to just stay in one zone on one thing yeah. uh, is very, very valuable. And to be okay not spinning every plate every day, I think, mm. is also another thing I've learned. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, get it done and move on. Um, did you want to say something about this novel of yours, this half-finished novel? Is that still a work in progress? Have you managed to finish it off? Um, I think the thing that I learned about writing is, like any creative process, which I'm involved in creative process every day, which is building software products, yeah. it is a huge amount of iteration, a huge amount of refinance. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's about falling out of sort of love with your ego and every yeah. single word, being willing to cut, start over, go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. you got to pivot in a novel as much as you pivot in a product, yeah. if you will. And uh, I uh, hammered out a good first draft, and I think I've probably got five years of iteration and refinement on the yeah. second draft. And uh, coming to terms with that was actually a really good thing for me. Uh -huh. um, I think there's so many things that when we go and try to create things, you know, I also write a lot of music on the guitar, and I've learned exactly the same thing. Sometimes you just got to write a song, leave it alone for two weeks, come back to it, change, change the chorus, change yeah. the verse, etc. Um, that. There is, I think, this perception of creation and artistry where it's just this like manic moment and this beautiful thing comes out. Mm -hmm. And 99% of things in the world don't ever work that way. Yeah. They take constant iteration and refinement over long periods of time, and then people only see the end point of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's an overnight success. 
Exactly. <laughs> so it's, it's true with writing a book or building a product or yeah. uh, anything like that. It's all, uh, takes time and effort and, and uh, refinement. Awesome. Well, I think we'll leave it there. So thank you so much for joining us today on the Future Squared podcast. Um, that was really insightful and um, definitely look forward to a lot of the, the positive feedback we get on this podcast and look forward to catching up again. You'll no doubt be around the traps here in Melbourne. And um, any final words for our, our listeners? Um, I would just say that I think uh, the number one thing that Australians should have is just is just pride in what's already here. Mm-hmm. I think it's really easy to look at what is in the U.S. or is in London or and sort of feel like you're always behind. Yeah. But there's more than enough going on here if we really kind of band together and help each other out mm-hmm. um, that we can play center stage with anybody else, whether it's you know Israel or Canada or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no reason that that can't happen. I think yeah. some of it is just actually believing that it can and it will and yeah. it'll, and it will get there. Exactly. And it's no different to people believing in their own capabilities and just that conviction. And if you've got that conviction, you go out and you do it. So couldn't agree more. Awesome. Thanks again, Neil. We'll see or we will speak to you guys again in future. Cheers. Right, cheers. Hey guys, Steve here. Hope you enjoyed today's Future Squared podcast with Neil Robertson. For more thought leadership by way of blogs, podcasts, and resources, head over to collectivecamp.us, where you can read all about innovation in the enterprise and startups. Catch you next time.